This is Nothing But That Sports Talk. Welcome to Nothing But That Sports Talk. I'm Rafi Kluzon alongside Renee Washington, ESPN reporter. Yeah, it's March Madness time. Welcome to the show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm loving the virtual background you've got going on too. Yes, I learned from you. I watch a lot of the, I watch a lot of your Zoom meetings. I watch a lot. I see you at NEBJ. And uh, yeah, I also see that you're back to doing in-person interviews, just like the way you did before COVID started. Now, it's, it's been a few years since you've been on the show. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to since the last time we've spoken? Yeah, it has been. It's crazy because I remember I was like living in a whole different spot. I was working in a whole different spot. A lot has definitely changed. I um, have been doing a lot of work with ESPN. So as you mentioned, um, around the pandemic, I've been back out at games for college athletics, um, sideline reporting, color commentary, play by play. And then also um, have been actively launching my own. So I've been taking this time, getting my own business going, writing my book, writing a book, um, just really growing in some other areas as well on the outside of reporting too. So it's been a lot of exciting things. I see you're doing great things as always too, though. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, the last time we spoke, and I've got two seasons of cover the WNBA in my pocket. I also had some rest for the NBA 2K League and USA basketball teams, teams including Kevin Durant. So yeah, just a lot of nu- nuggets to build up. I mean, seriously. But um, yeah, for what you've seen in my craft, like. What do you think about all the interviews I've done the WNBA and the NBA? It's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, honestly, anytime you can continue to get experience and reps and continue to have conversations, um, it, it only can help. So definitely continue to learn and grow and find unique ways and, and angles to tell stories and to go about uh, creating content, even something as little as changing your background to have a virtual background. You know, you wanna, I always tell people, continue to find ways to to raise the bar, your own bar, you know, like, you know, before, as you even mentioned, now getting credentialed to do more events, being able to get to more WNBA games and, and more NBA and just in these different spaces, that's raising the bar. So I see you doing it, it I love it. I love this, I always enjoy watching people on their grind, um, like ourselves, continuing to find ways to, to learn more and grow more in their career. So definitely keep up the great work, yeah. It's because of the craft of development, I managed to add three people from your Big Mavens group in Brian, Ashley Baker, Gerd, some, some very talented people. I mean, I've had Nicole Nelson on the show a couple of times. Some very talented people that you, that you work with that you have your own Media Maven group. But mm-hmm. let me ask you this one question. What gave you the idea to put together this Media Maven group in the first place? Oh, you know, it actually happened organically. Um, I'm, I'm part of a number of groups, but this group of Kelsey, Ashley, Brian, Brandon, and myself, we are all very good friends. So we actually talk all the time. It's not even just a um, reporting specific group. You know, we all have connected through our various work and NABJ and being in the area and um, started just doing in the pandemic, started doing virtual shows together and just you know taking time to to put together we did like an end of 2020 show we did um an an, um super bowl preview show like we just did various content together because we're all individually doing our own things and we decided to collaborate and put together some shows as a group so honestly that's something that i have learned that is so valuable is to find ways to build your own within your community your own networks and your own groups um, the people that you can now turn to for feedback, collaboration, insight, you know, I've been on their stuff, they've been on my stuff, you know, that's, it takes a village, it takes a village. So they're a big part of my village in that sense, as friends also, as co- more than just colleagues, but also as friends and almost, and family in that sense. And I'm glad you're able to do it. And it's, it's so far, you people have done amazing jobs. I mean, you got Brian, who's not only doing content for the major sports, but he's also doing content focusing on WWE. I'm a diehard WWE fan, too. I watch it. I've been to the first wrestling show when they came to the Barclays Center in 2012. I've been to some Ron's and SmackDown. I've been to, I've been to WWE shows. I, I, I've seen it with my own two eyes. <laughs> and, then, and then you have Nicole, Kelsey Nicole Nelson, who's doing an amazing job, not just as a gender professor, but she's also doing reporting for the Washington Commanders. Well, it was Washington football team. I'm glad they got rid of that name. 
<laughs> right now, and then now you doing some amazing work. Lysala Hall of Fame. Too bad your basketball team couldn't make it to the March Madness tournament, but that's a conversation for later. But you're in the Soccer Hall of Fame. Phenomenal no work. I knew you were a phenomenal athlete back in your time. Now you're in the Hall of Fame. You covered Philadelphia Union soccer games. Too bad NYCFC is the one that walked up with the MLS Cup, but yeah. It's good to see you get to do the sports you love, the sport that you play. You even do a sport that, that really pop, like swimming, diving. You took yeah. whatever you get from ESPN Plus. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, what's that, that like is, for you? That's been a great experience um, because it has allowed me to, but I, I always tell people there's always so much value in working in other areas, you know, so basketball, soccer, and football are my big three. I obviously played soccer um, and I also played basketball and then have actively grown up in a sports family of watching basketball, football, and soccer. So it comes natural to me. Those are the sports that I am most passionate about, that I enjoy the most. But I've also taken time to learn about every sport that I possibly can. You know, I I have honestly covered on whether on the youth level, collegiate level, or professional level, almost every sport except for like tennis and golf. You know, I can actively say I've now covered softball, baseball, swimming and diving. Um, I actually also this spring I've been working in men's and women's lacrosse, uh, field hockey, volleyball. You know, I've been able to, and fortunate to work in so many different areas and it just allows you to step outside your comfort zone. You know, if everything is always the same in terms of the content and the storylines, you're not even, you're not challenging yourself, which means you're not growing. So having to cover the Ivy League Men's Swimming and Diving Championship, um, which was my first meet, you know, and, and my first time covering a swim meet. And of course, it's the conference championship, which is major. Um, just allowed me and forced me to have to be challenged in a unique way to figure out how I can tell these stories. You know, how do I come into this space that I'm not known? They don't know me as Renee, the Hall of Fame soccer player or, you know, anything else. They just see me as a reporter. And so to be able to have to come into those spaces and figure your, out your way and learn even the best angles to tell a story or to ask questions as you're giving interviews. It just allows you to think differently. So there's so much value in like stepping outside of that comfort zone. I don't expect to work in every sport, although who knows uh, what my path will take me to. But in the meantime, I'm just enjoying learning about every sport, every level, every production team operates differently. You know, like one on um, the Ivy League may be different than the AAC, which may be different than the Philadelphia Union, which is different than the Washington Commanders. Which, you know, every role that I've held, we work in a different way, which allows me to learn so much about myself and also just about the way the industry is. So um, it's honestly a great experience. And the swimming and diving community really welcomed me with open arms and was so like so polite, so welcoming, so excited to have me there. Um, lacrosse has been the same way. So this spring I've been diving into pun intended of <laughs> some other sports and other areas. Yeah. And now that all these sports are in the off season, well, with the exception of basketball, because well, March match is coming up. Uh, you got, you have time to actually continue to find ways to develop your craft. I mean, too bad you have to shut down beyond the headlines, but while we're on the subject, what made you decide to shut down beyond the headlines? Yeah, so actually none of my leagues are in all season right now. I'm I'm, act, I'm very, very actively uh, booked and busy in that sense. So, um, you know, I created Beyond the Headlines, my, my podcast, as a platform, as a way to create content. And it's it's been great. You know, I was fortunate to be able to have it work um, streamed through Fox Sports and have a lot of incredible guests on and incredible just memories through that over the year since I created it in July of 2019. But it was time. It was time. I have a lot of career moves on the horizon and I had to prioritize and figure out what makes most sense for me moving forward. And unfortunately, my show just, it got put on the back burner. You know, it was a tough decision, but I had to figure out which areas of my life I can, um, maybe take a step back and which areas I can continue to grow. And with plants and not buried growing with um, all the focus I've had on writing books. And then of course my reporting career growing, it just, 
it felt like time and it's been, it's been weird. I spent so long building, you know how it is when you're building up a show and you're building up a brand and everything. Um, and I built a lot of the graphics and, and just it vibe of the show up over the years that that was my baby. And so it's definitely hard to step away. I actually have been, um, still working through like kind of removing it from things, but it, it's the end of an era, but it's because I, one window is closing and a much bigger door is opening. So I've got some exciting news on the horizon and I had to scale back some things in order to prepare for that. And so my show was one of the first things to go. And my work with Fox Sports has actually come to an end altogether too. So my Mystics, Wizards coverage, my show, all of that has um, come to an end so I can refocus in some areas of my career. Yeah, and focus more on doing some ESPN content since, well, I know, I know. Well, there's still softball. There's still, still baseball to focus on. So, luckily, even though, I mean, I don't know what you're gonna do for March Madness, but I know there's you have you have something coming up. Oh, uh, there's a lot. Oh yeah, there's always a lot up my sleeves. There is no off season for me. Um, <laughs> there's a lot on the horizon. Actually, um, more than ever, I, I really am taking a, a much needed step in my career and so that's why I was like as I'm moving forward I've got to kind of let go of some things and that and that's one of them but um you know that I do have a lot this upcoming spring between spring sports and just some new opportunities that are unfolding as well um that I will be an- announcing shortly I'm not going to say anything yet but I will be announcing shortly um so that's that's a big reason why it's like I had to I had to have that closure you know um get things in order as I'm preparing or what's next and don't but don't worry i'm sure when you have some space in between you're probably gonna at least at least think, think of bringing that show back but that's another topic for another day but while we're on the subject of march madness i mean why don't you talk about like which teams which are the double digit seeds you think is make the biggest impact in this year's tournaments yeah are we talking men's hoops or women's hoops starting with the men's side okay awesome um you know I wish I could say I've been actively following any specific team. Um, I, other than the teams that I've been covering, which are not in the NCAA tournament, um, I have not been actively covering all of college troops this year. It's been a crazy, crazy time for me. But I just love the fact that, you know, we have March Madness in full effect. We have the excitement back of being able to have our brackets busted and some broken hearts. And even at the the close of the season, we've been seeing some crazy, crazy results. Um, Obviously watching all that has unfolded around Coach K in his final season, um, you know, that UNC Duke game was definitely not only financially a big ticket, literally, um, but just had a lot of people locked in and tuned in. Um, And then even just Duke in general, um, how they've been struggling. So I don't have a favorite right now. I don't, I don't know. I don't even have any big predictions, but I'm just really excited that March Madness is here. And especially after uh, 2020, I will never take for granted um, the fact that we get a postseason for any sport in any league. So yeah, I'm, I don't, I got I have to figure out who my team is. I'm not sure yet who that's gonna be, but right now I'm just excited for these first rounds of games. Yeah, I'm excited too, man. What well, I am excited to announce is that I got Baylor, Arizona, Auburn, and Duke, obviously, because, you know, I need to see Coach K make one final push to the Final Four in his his coaching career as my Final Four predictions. I know you're going to do a lot of looking into it, and you're probably not going to get to talk talk more depth about it, but whenever I bring you back on the show, you probably, the line's going to become a lot more clear to you. Now, does that decision apply to the women's side? Because women's side does have a lot of crazy teams coming up you got Caitlin Clark's Iowa you got Aliyah Boston in South Carolina North Carolina State Ari's favorite team or in this case the college she went to UConn they're going to be a problem with AZ FUD Paige Becker's coming back like which which of those teams on the names I just mentioned are going to be more impressive and do you see a double digit seed get out of the first round for the women's bracket yeah, I mean, there's honestly for the men's and the women's side, there's always a Cinderella team. I that's what we love, right? We love to see those double digit seeds, those 11 to, to 16 seeds that are able to do, you know, the, the unthinkable and knock somebody off. Um, I don't know who that's going to be this year, but I, I, I love a good upset. 
Um, but I think the, the biggest thing about women's hoops this year that's exciting is, of course, last year we, we remember when everything came out about the equipment, the you know weight room and everything that was not anywhere near what the men's side was. And, you know, with having a year of now preparing for another postseason, I'm excited to see how for women's basketball, it's rolled out, you know, the the vibe around it, the excitement around it, the hype around it, because there, as you mentioned, there are some really good teams in women's basketball. And I don't know who my pick is for that either. I need to, I need to figure this out, but I, I just, I usually don't have a team. I just like to watch. I just love watching great basketball. I love Iowa um, and what they're doing, even like Maryland, Arizona, you know, um, of course, UConn, but there are a lot of really good teams in in basketball right now, which is what's making it even more exciting that we're seeing such great talent across college hoops. So I'm looking forward to it. Do you have a, do you have a team that's your, that's your favorite? UConn or NC State or Iowa. Okay. Or South Carolina. I mean, that's not my final four, but those are teams I would prefer yeah. to see get that far. But let's be honest, if you're being realistic, the, the only those teams I just mentioned are capable to win the championship, I feel. Because if you can, if you follow Caitlin Clark, you can tell the type of score to what those this girl's getting. And if you follow Paige Becker's UConn, we don't need to talk about the history of UConn. Mm-hmm. You can just do your research. They've had undefeated seasons, and they've had seasons where they couldn't even get past the final four. I mean, they were on the wrong end of getting taken out by Arizona, but whatever. And I remember last year, you had Texas a and M for the Riverside getting to the Sweet 16 on a buzzer beater. Yeah. On the yeah. men's side, you had Oral Roberts get to the first two rounds as a 15 seed. A few years before that, you, ha- you had a 16 in UMBC take out Virginia, a DMV college basketball team. Yep. That's what we love to see. You saw Texas A&M come back from 10 points down to force overtime against Northern Iowa in less than a minute. Yeah. And what, are some of your greatest mem- what are some of your greatest memories of March Madness during the years when you was following it? Uh, I'm following. I just haven't been locked in. Um, so I, who could forget the year that uh, Villanova knocked off UNC on the buzzer beater? On the buzzer beater. We can't forget oh, that, yeah. man. Was that 2016? Yeah. Yeah, it was 2016. Um, insane, insane. And then, of course, as I went to LaSalle, I did get not only a chance to watch, but to be a part of LaSalle's Sweet 16 run back in 20, that would have been 2012, when they ran, when the um, men's basketball team went to the Sweet 16 and they were a Cinderella team. So, not only have I experienced college hoops and the excitement as a viewer, but also was there on, you know, when our campus was insane around it um but i I love some i love the cinderella teams you know even looking back as far as like what steph curry was able to do with davidson and what um oh last year around gonzaga and you know there's just so many teams that you find yourself just loving great basketball you know on the men's and women's side um Ari McDonald, what she was able to do. Like there are so many names and highlights and images that flash in my head of players putting team on their back, knocking down big shots. Baylor, obviously for men's basketball um, and women's basketball, you know, just over the years, that's what, that's the resilience, that's the excitement. That's, I'm like getting chills even thinking about it because that's what brings us to all love March Madness. It's, it's just the raw, authentic, great moments of like, Number one seed, number 16, doesn't matter. Step between the lines. Let's see who's the better team today. And watching those upsets and watching the, the tears of fans and players. Ah, oh, I love it. It's time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And don't forget about the years where Chase Parker led Tennessee to two straight national oh, championships. Yes. It was the East of past summer. And, and Brittany Griner, I hope she gets out of prison, having that undefeated team with Baylor getting mm-hmm. to the national championships, taking out UConn. Oh, yeah, and uh, even Monica McNutt knows what it's like to compete against Baylor. I mean, she ain't got to guard her, but she competed. But her yeah. but her oh, Georgetown yeah. competed against that girl's team. And you yeah, see, we're going that, that far back. That UConn women's basketball, uh, of course, the dynasty lasted for a decade. But when you think back over the years of the different players that played at UConn and, and then Brittany Griner at Baylor and Skylar Diggins at the time before she was uh, married, 
you know, all those big names. I loved, I loved what Pat and Candace did um, at Tennessee. You know, there have been some legendary teams over the years. And as you even mentioned recently with Dawn Staley um, with South Carolina, you know, she's been having such a successful time, whether it's from the contract that she well-deserved or even the success the team's been having. You know, there's been a lot of big names over the decades in college hoops. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been Oh yeah, we can't forget about it. Oh yeah, we can't forget about Ricky Cooper Huawei's two straight buzzer beers to get a national championship in 2018. Mm-hmm. That, that that was just ridiculous. That's why she's one of my favorite players. Mickey Dallas Weeks, my favorite team in the oh, WNBA. Yeah. Well, not really my favorite team. I'm a Liberty fan, but yeah. You know what? Stick it with let's. But you know what? To change just a little bit, we're about two months away from the upcoming WNBA season. And you saw how the run with the New York Liberty ended. The last time you was on the show, we talked about what's really necessary. Gonna, impact for the New York Liberty and and yeah two seasons later she only played four games in the bubble Liberty only won two games they improved the win total by a mile but couldn't get past the face Mercury was down and Tarasi was in and out I mean Yonescu did start off her career start off the second season with a buzzer beater off the Indiana Fever went up finishing with the worst record that season but yeah they, they were kind of horrific in the second half but what are your impressions about the way Sabrina Yonescu has grown during the first few years in the WNBA? Yeah, she's she's a, a great player, and it's unfortunate she's had injuries that have um, definitely hindered that. But <clears throat> excuse me, I think that for Sabrina and for the the Liberty, this is this is a group that if they can stay healthy, you know, they have they have a lot of talent across this roster and a young team too, that you have to keep an eye on them. And I think that she's just one of a number of players that you can think of across across the roster that it, <clears throat> the Liberty are a team, much like the, for New York basketball, I should say, is, is coming back in a big way, you know, and has been honest, obviously, but they are, they, you can't sleep. There was a, there was a slump. I hate to say it, there was a slump. But when you look at what Sabrina, Dee Dee Richards, um, the different the, players, the have, yeah, the, the different players that have been able to put New York, the New York Liberty on the map, it reminds me of when I was growing up and they had mm-hmm. Teaspoon, Teresa Witherspoon playing, mm-hmm. um, and the different players that I used to, I used to go to Liberty games and loved watching them play. And the Liberty are a team that has a lot of exciting players, talented players. Um, and so I, I think the biggest thing is it's not just Sabrina, you know, she, she's such a, a big name, but she's, and such a big part of this group, but she's going to go and this team's going to go as they continue to grow their depth. They continue to grow with their experience. That's what made the Chicago sky, uh, so, so hard to beat, And, and obviously eventually a champion, because you looked at all the way through how they had just been building towards this moment. So I think the Liberty on that building phase that. You, we a year or two. Look, look where we were. Like you said, a year or two ago. I guess it's two years ago now. Two years ago, actually. Liberty. Now, fast forward two years from now. I bet you we're having a complete different conversation about them being a contender, being a, a top team, um, consistently in the league that you could see winning a championship. Exactly. Yeah. They picked up Stephanie Dolson. They mm-hmm. brought back Rebecca Allen. I could see New York Liberty getting out the first round and lasting like yeah. one or two games, not like like four or five games with whoever they get. It's just a matter of how they're going to compete with teams like the Las Vegas Aces, the Connecticut Sun, Sun, because those teams, they're going to be tough to beat since the New York Liberty had to face Connecticut Sun to start the season. Why? They get the tough opponent, and it's on ESPN, the family of networks. Yeah, the Liberty are not good enough to be any of those teams. There's a lot of talent in the WNBA, you know? Yes, there is. Honestly, it's something that I know um, has been brought up around expansion because when you look at some teams like mm-hmm. the Mercury, the Aces, uh, the Storm, it's it's almost like an all-star team. You can't believe they have so much talent across their roster of having two, three of the biggest names in the league on their team. So, um, yeah, the Liberty, the Aces, the, there's a lot. And even you look at teams like the Mystics who were injury bitten. Um, you know, how do these teams come back this year? So that's what makes the start of the season. Of course, the, the draft is coming up. The start of the season's coming up. It makes it so exciting to know that, like, there are so much talent, young up-and-coming teams, and then the established 
teams that now have that or always have that target on their back, the sky, the aces, the mercury, um, the sun, you know, that it's, it's fun. It's almost time. Don't worry. Yeah. And I even have fun watching Diane Taurasi he say 50 when I talk to her on the Zooms. Yeah. I mean that on ESPN, you, well, so, as somebody that's a reporter for ESPN Plus, have you seen that interview get leaked? No, oh, no. no. And though you have to be, well, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you later. But anyways, I want to ask quick tonight with now this transition to the NBA. I know you saw uh, Kevin Durant go off of 53 against my New York Knicks. I'm a New York Knicks fan, but Kevin Durant had another phenomenal 50 point game. Like not too long after Kyrie Irving went off of 50 against Charlotte. But let me ask you a question. Why don't you give a why don't you give a little bit of state of the Brooklyn Nets as far as like from where you've been following your impressions about the way they started off hot, then they progressed a lot with the Kevin Durant injury. They trade for Ben Simmons. Kyrie Irving can't still can't play home games even with the mandates getting rid up because of the private employee specter. What what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's messy. It's a lot, um, and unfortunately, it might be what keeps the Nets from being a championship team. You know, um, I don't see the home mandates and rules changing for Kyrie. So what happens when you get to the playoffs and you're in a best of seven series and you have to play at home, but you can't actually play? You know, like we this is something that when the season started, we none of us knew how long this was going to last. Here we are in March. We're nearing the playoffs. We're nearing the end of the season. Kyrie, now what? You know, Brooklyn, now what? So obviously the trade with uh, Ben Simmons and James Harden, and I've been watching how electric Philadelphia has been since James Harden came into the city. Um, but for Ben Simmons and Brooklyn, the question, the thing is now, it's going to be even tougher. I know they, the Nets just beat the Sixers by nearly 30, but I'm not, I'm taking that with a grain of salt. How is Ben Simmons going to transition into the Nets? Because time is ticking. James Harden and, and the Sixers are working through it right now of like, you've got to figure each other out. You've got to get those reps together, those minutes together. You've got to figure out how you can play off of each other. If you're Joel and James and you're adding in the complimentary pieces, how does Ben fit into Brooklyn? And are they going to have enough time to work him in before the playoffs start? Because not only is he new coming in the team, he hasn't been playing all season. We see how tough it's been at times for James Harden and, and the Sixers to get a rhythm. And James Harden, although he's been having some injury problems too, of course, he's been at least playing this season. How does Ben transition into finally getting back into, you know, a full game routine and then with a completely new team? And then also he had been struggling, of course, in the past, which is why the whole issue around him happened in the first place. So I think Brooklyn has on paper you see Kyrie, Ben, Kevin Durant, you're like, oh, great, this is a championship team. Kevin Durant's got to stay healthy. Kyrie can't play at home games, so that's going to be a big impact come playoff time. And then how will Ben Simmons really make that adjustment into the net? So there's a lot of unknown, and there's not a lot of time on their side, unfortunately. Not to mention there are a lot of teams in the East alone that are, like, rolling. That, you know, the Bucks. Um, I'll put the Bulls in that category, the Sixers, of course. Um, you know, there are a lot of teams in the East, Miami, that you have to keep an eye on. So I just think that the Nets might run out of time. It might be an issue of like, yeah, they really did late. Yeah, they really did. Ben Simmons had to ramp up a lot. And you saw, and you saw that it's just, it's, it takes a lot for a player to start ramping up the minute they decide, you know what, I'm coming back and playing things the way they are. I mean, we, I mean, I mean, I get it. A part-time Kyrie Irving, a Kevin Durant when healthy, and a Ben Simmons is, is not going to win championship this year. I won't be embarrassed by that. And sadly, we're going to be sitting through another first-round exit against either Miami or Milwaukee or Philadelphia, no matter how how high they face the standards, because they're too far behind. I mean, with, I'm with little time to turn things around, but at least the Nets are doing it right now, and they're going to get the best seed they can get. I still yeah. think they could get out the first round, but it's going to yeah. be tough. But even with Kevin Durant going off for a 53, like, like what, what could part Kevin Durant did in 2011, it's going to take a little bit of time. It really and the is. difference is he has to now. You know, um, I know reports are saying that, like, Steve Nash thinks that Ben Simmons will be back, but they're not sure if his back issues will keep him out the rest of the season. We don't really know the timeline exactly. And we don't know how he's going to come back. Because, again, when's the last time we saw Ben Simmons playing in a game? So um, 
you know, I think the hardest, the biggest thing for Kevin Durant, it's like great he's putting these numbers up, but he has to put these numbers up. As you mentioned, the term part-time Kyrie, he is. You know, and, and there's a lot of extra going on. I saw even the issue because he was in the locker room. That was an issue. You know, there's all these extra external things going on outside of basketball, unfortunately, that are affecting Kyrie and the Nets. So Kevin Durant's got to put the team on his back in that sense. And with so much talent in the league and the and the East, I, I'm not picking them as a favorite to come out of the East. I don't, I think they can absolutely get out of the first round. Um, not, of course, sure who they'll be facing, but... When you look across the the NBA and even teams like the Cavs are playing really well. Like there there's a lot of teams that are making some noise and nobody's scared of the Nets, you know? People are going to come in right and knock the Nets off. So, um I see them getting past the first round, but I don't think they're going to reach what a lot of people are expecting, which is a championship caliber team. I could be yeah, wrong. Championship, I I, the yeah, championship aspirations just like the Los Angeles Lakers. You know what? Let's transition to your Los Angeles Lakers. You're a LeBron fan. I know you're dis- disappointed about the way the Lakers have been playing. It, it, like they, he lost in the first round finally. Okay, we'll let that go. LeBron's never lost in the first round of his life, life up until last year. So don't don't worry. The guys made it to so many finals. I wouldn't let that. Uh, if I was you, I wouldn't let that bother you one bit. This year they're they're like ten games below 500, barely good enough to get into a playing tournament. What, what, what's going through my seeing LeBron's Lakers play the way they played these past few seasons after winning the championship in the 2020 bubble? It could have been DeMar DeRozan is all I keep going back to. Um, you know, I know, I think it was Magic Johnson that was saying, if the Lakers don't get past the first round, it's going to be a, a bust season. No, it's already a bust season because I don't think they're making the playoffs. Even if they That's get into the playoffs. That's by Toronto. Game, I, yeah, I don't think that they are making it into the playoffs. So I, I have no ac- expectations of them getting past up any round. Um, but I think it's unfortunate. You know, this is this is a good example, unfortunately, of how on paper, much like you were just talking about with the Nets, on paper, a team can look great, but it doesn't matter. Sports are all about chemistry, how the players play off of each other. You know, how did their different individual styles and players and talents come together as a team and when you look at it an older lakers team i think the the key things are anthony davis has been so injury bitten and we talk a lot about russell westbrook but ad does not get enough of the flack that he should because he's underperforming he's been injured he's supposed to be the young talent that's really driving this team and he's not he has not been the last couple of seasons he has not been and so that's a disappointment there of course russell westbrook has been tough but Russell Westbrook has also played on four different teams in the last four seasons. Please tell me anybody that can do that at any level of their career and step right in and be fine. That's a lot mentally. He's of course has a, a young family. That's so personally, it's a him. You're having to move and, and change and you're going from, you know, um, team to team, coast to coast. So that's a lot. That's not easy for anybody. I don't think anybody can even move jobs four times in four years and just be fine. You know, that you're learning all these different personalities and he has a strong personality. So it's not a great combination. Let's just be honest um, of of, as everybody, you know, as was thought. I do think that like players like Melo and Dwight, you know, they, they, the older players, they're what what they're supposed to, but it comes down to the fact that LeBron is still playing very well. Anthony Davis has not been able to stay healthy or, or do well. And then Russell Westbrook is not a good mix. So Again, that DeMar DeRozan option looking a little bit better now. And look what happened. DeMar DeRozan's been... Yeah. And look what happened. DeMar DeRozan's been killing it with the Chicago Bulls. Two buzzer beans in a row. To, one to finish out 2021. Another to finish out 2022. This guy's been killing it. He turned Chicago's franchise around. He's not. They may not be good enough to make it to the finals and win the championship against either the Phoenix Suns or the Memphis Grizzlies. My pick right. to make it to the NBA Finals or the Golden State Warriors, but you got to give credit credit to Chicago. They developed a lot through those trades. The rebuild is actually paid off, yeah. at least for this regular season. But let's see a transition to the playoffs. Now, I know you saw the New York Knicks got back to me in the playoffs in 2021 and. They regressed a lot in 2022. So, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the Knicks, 
are in a situation, and honestly, the Bulls will probably be like this next year, where when you have a, a great season like they did last year, you've got to find a way to keep the momentum going. And they didn't do anything major in the off season. You know, I think you've got to, I'm trying to think back of what moves they actually would have made. Um, but you've got to find a way to build off of that. Like the Hawks, the Knicks, the Bulls this year, um, the Grizzlies are in that spot. Like they are taking those next steps, but there are a lot of teams as you just mentioned, the Warriors, the Suns, the Bucks, the the Sixers, the Nets. There are a lot of teams that we're talking about in this true championship contender. So that next tier of teams, such as the Knicks, they have to find a way to be in that. And you need to have all stars, which they do have. Julius Randle plays very well, and um, Obi comes and goes, and R.J. Barrett. You know, they've got a lot of talent. And I actually just watched them um, lose to the Sixers a couple weeks ago. But Mm -hmm. you have to figure out a way to take that next step so that you can now consistently be a team that's the top of the standing and truly in that conversation. So I think they dropped the ball a little bit, to be honest. And maybe this is kind of that wake up call, like more work has to be done. You, you, when you look at the top teams season after season, the Bucks are about the, excuse me, the only exception of a team that won a championship with like their true core. Most teams have to bring in somebody significant. Even they did too. Have to bring in somebody that's going to help you take that next step. So for the Knicks, who is that? And what does that look like? Because they have to figure that out for next year. They thought they figured it out when they picked up Kimber Walker and Evan Fournier, but yeah. Kimber Walker's knees could not hold up. As much as I like having them on the Knicks on its own, I got to admit he's underachieved. And Evan Fournier, when, when, when he's not playing the Boston Celtics, He's not going to give you a 30 or 40 point game consistently. No, and Kemba's not a good fit, unfortunately. Um, you know, that whole that whole thing was a debacle and a mess to even watch unfold, too, because he still has some years left in him, but he's not the, the piece that the Knicks needed. Um, so that was a shame, even to watch him going from being a player that was brought in to help to being a player that couldn't even get off the bench. So it, yeah, that's, they, they, they missed out on that one, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad to to see the the, that you actually see New York Knicks mess seriously. They're close though. They're close. A lot closer than they were. Let's be much like, that's why I put them in the category with the bulls because people are not only talking about them, but it's exciting to watch the Knicks play. You know, that Knicks-Nets game, and you look back at over the course of the season, the Knicks are going to give you an exciting game of basketball. Oh, yeah, without but question. That come from my win against the Celtics? Yeah, but I they're mean, just not – come playoff time. Like, my my thing is it's such a long season in the regular season. You have to be building towards the playoffs because that's a whole mm-hmm. different game. That's a whole different level of pressure. And you have to be built to win a series. You know, winning one great game – cool that's cute but you have to be able to win a best of seven which is different not every not every team is built for that so when you look across the board you've got to have the depth you've got to have those all-stars in place and then you also have to hope that you're healthy because that's something you can't fully control um so of course seeing like a cp3 injury like that's devastating for phoenix so there's a lot of pieces that have to come together but what you can control is adding adding those pieces. And so the Knicks are exciting. They play like an aggressive, high tempo brand of basketball, but they're still missing someone. I don't know who that is, but they're still missing at least one piece to to take that next. Exactly. You know what? These type of things happen. You go from overachieving four seed to aggressing a lot this season. I mean, I mean, let's, I mean, and I'm just thinking logically. Renee Washington, you were a former soccer player. You had one you had one season where your teams like in a top four of your your conference or a top four of your division. The very next year, you kind of, you underachieve a lot. Like if you was if you was put in the New York Knicks shoes, like what would you do to actually help your team get back to where you were two years ago at the start? Yeah, yeah. Now, in my defense, my teams did not regress. We progressed. We moved up, but. Um, honestly, just having been in those situations, that does add another layer of pressure because you go into a season and, and I, I can speak from experience. Like my first year at LaSalle, we won our, I mean, we went to the conference tournament for the first time ever um, and won a game. 
And so there was no expectation. You know, we were doing something that hadn't been done before. So we were just going into it as an underdog with no expectations, able to just play. But from that point forward, as we started winning tournaments, uh, conference tournaments, winning our regular season, getting to the end of the tournament, the bar continues to raise. And it's not easy to be able to match that pressure. You know, it's one thing when you're going into a season with no expectation. Like the Cavs are a really good example. Nobody has expectation on the Cavs, you know? So them sitting right now in a top eight spot in the East is like, whoa, it's mind blowing. But now the Cavs, the Bulls, okay, now that eyes are on you, you've got to continue that. And that's where the Knicks have dropped the ball because actually when I, I didn't realize how low they are now, but they've really dropped in standings. Um, The Wizards are another team that had eyes on them after they had a a great start to the season. You know, it's hard to have the ability to keep up with that pressure once it's on you. And I think the Knicks have have literally dropped the ball in that sense. So they've got to figure out how to mentally push through that. But also, um, like I said, they've got to be more aggressive in making some moves in the offseason. And Julius Randle has to work his way towards being the Julius Randle we saw last year because – as Steve they Smith keep on saying, you're not using your right hand. He's always going left. I mean, kind of but you can't. But then again, you can't help the you can't help the way that the person shoots what hand that the person shoots with that he's comfortable with. I understand you want to adapt to learning learning other skills of basketball the same way you would have had to if you if you were still playing soccer right now. But sometimes you got to do what you're comfortable doing. I keep saying this in past episodes. It's, it, it's all about. Be comfortable with what you're doing. And, I mean, to be fair, he's not used to playing that well in front of fans. Like, at the beginning of last year, there were no fans in the building. So, Julius Randle didn't have to worry about the pressure of just dropping 30 or 40 every night in front of a large crowd. There were no fans up until, like, one or two months of the season, something like that. So, of course, he's going to reach that that regression when you're having those type of performances or from when you're having those type of performances, rather, it's a, that's that's how it is in basketball. You have some good years, you have some good back bad years. That's how it goes. Yeah, and I think that Julius Randle's game is one that kind of does naturally go up and down just because of the way that he plays. First of all, fans aren't going to like him. He's not a likable player. That said, so he's get he's someone that's going to hear a lot of noise on the road. Um, but also, we're in a sp- a spot now in basketball, especially where you have to continue especially as a big man, to find ways to do, like Joel Embiid and, and uh, Nikola Jokic have done, of being more. And sometimes Julius Randle is a little bit easier to defend, um, a little bit more predictable. So he's got to act, figure out a way to add some of that versatility and, um, you know, take that even for him to be that leader for the Knicks. Yeah, you really do. Now, we're in the middle of Women's History Month. Like, as, as a woman doing serious work in the sports industry what does women's history month mean to you yeah it's it's everything um you know we have black history month in february we have women's history month in march and so i get back to back months but i think the biggest thing for me is it shouldn't just be one month it shouldn't be one day one week one month you know these celebrations should be all the time and so i am encouraged by the way that society celebrates women during the month of March and takes time to really promote and share and highlight all the great things that women have been doing over the years, the pioneers and trailblazers. Um, So as a female myself, to see that representation and to see um, just the the way that women are continuing to to, um, make change and be in these different spaces is powerful and it's empowering in that sense and inspiring. So, um, you know, I'm, I always enjoy this time of year because it is a lot of celebration and a lot of um, just taking time to positively highlight the great things that are happening in society. But much like I said, at the end of Black History Month, it's not just a month. It's not just, you know, a time you, on your calendar that businesses and networks and people should be having these conversations. This should be all year round. We should be having, we should be having the same energy throughout the course of the year, the remainder of the other 11 months, not just in March for women or in February for for Black people. So I enjoy it. I appreciate it. And I'm hoping that it continues beyond uh, the calendar month. Yeah, exactly. We need more episodes like this. And one of these days, you inspired me to actually do like a women's sports panel. I mean, I'm a Black man doing the women's sports panel 
But it's not a really issue because you're connected with women in the industries out there that they're in. Rather, you're an actor or a performer or a sports reporter. You're, you're, get, you're going to get recognized for the work you do during Women's History Month. That's how it is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But um, yeah, this is how you end this episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. Thank you so much for stopping by, Renee Washington, after a few years in. And hopefully that we can sneak in some time to do more episodes down the road. Because I yeah, really love having sports me. conversations with you and among other people that I've had on the show. Thank you Definitely. once again. And to all the balls out there, get your head in the game.